Hi everyone, I'm Spencer Powers. Uh, welcome to the Bitcoin Club and uh, happy to have Professor Shaw um, give us his speech about uh, the work he's done over the past year and the paper that was published last year. Um, just before we get started, out of interest, um, like, it would be good for us to know what courses everyone's from, so, you know, we don't need to go one by one, but who here is from Sloan? Uh, and then core six, and so, any, any, anyone else? Okay, great, so that's what we kind of figured. Uh, so welcome to the, the Bitcoin Club meeting, and after Professor Shaw's uh, presentation, if you want to stick around, we'll have kind of an informal introduction to the uh, MIT Bitcoin Club and um, kind of get to know more about you, and uh, you can learn more about the Bitcoin Club. And, uh, give it off to Professor Shaw. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, thanks for having me. So, so thanks a lot for all of you showing up at uh, 6 p.m., uh, especially on such a nice day. It means a lot. So uh, before we go get started, let me tell you that this talk, uh, or this work, is as much about Bitcoin as uh, it could have been about any other financial instrument. Uh, the reason we chose Bitcoin is, and I'll explain you in a second, uh, was a uh, very good reason. Okay, I'll give you my reasons. What this talk is about is trying to understand that if we have a very simple uh, Bayesian regression method, it's uh, like the nearest neighbor like method, uh, which is a very good version. And if you have this simple method, can you use it and sort of uh, get some signal out from a uh, data which is uh, a series data? And, uh, the reason we chose Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin or Bitcoin prices is that A, first of all, it's publicly available, so we could sort of get all the information that we wanted. Uh, two, it's, uh, it has reasonable volume, and there are enough people, if you observe sort of how the trades are happening, there's a reasonable sort of amount of uh, automated trading happening. So whatever signal is out there, first order of signal is gone. So really, so if your algorithm can do well in terms of predicting prices, for example, there's some value to that. And the third is, it's in some sense, it's an isolated, uh, unlike sort of uh, standard, uh, let's say, uh, NYSC, where I've got a bunch of other options so I can sort of do portfolio. Here, I've got only one thing to uh, uh, invest in. So that sort of that gave us sort of a perfect environment to sort of understand sort of this how simple methods can uh, whether they have any value in terms of extracting signal out. Right, so with that in mind. Uh, this is a work with uh, my former student, Kang Zhang, who is now at, uh, in New York for obvious reasons. Um, so this is a slide I usually have in case sort of people don't know about Bitcoin. I'm sure you, all of you know. In case you don't know, uh, was, there was a sort of uh, uh, individual in ADS who started uh, uh, this currency. It's unregulated, so the thing I like about it, or not like about it, is that it's following. I come from India, and in uh, India, I think there are reasonably corrupt politicians. Um, now, here's what happens. The one law that sort of is a beautiful law says something like this. That if you are an individual, and if, the, the, if I view you as a sort of system with amount of income input that I've seen over years, and sort of the, the amount of ownership that you have, which adds up a lot more than what your input is, then there's something wrong, and then now I can sort of hold you for unaccountably. Uh, if you, in principle, you could sort of use Bitcoin to sort of get away from that. Unfortunately, a lady, a politician in southern part of India, did not know Bitcoins, so she got caught recently, which was great. And that was an <laughs> amusement. Uh, what we were interested in is given sort of a reasonable transaction volume and given reasonable market fair, and given that sort of there are enough people, as you can see, Notice from uh, the transaction data, people are doing, uh, trying to make money out of it. The market is not uh, is reasonably efficient at some level. So the question is sort of, can you in this efficient market still extract signal out? Can you predict the price? And if so, can you make profitable strategy out of it? Okay, so that's what I'm going to explain in the next few slides. So here's what we did: we collected data from OKCoin OK from Feb 2014 to July 2014, roughly uh, five months. Uh, the price of Bitcoin, but also it's the order book, as many of you would know. Uh, what's the order book? Just to remind ourselves, in any any such exchange, 
uh, you go and you say, I want to buy a coin at $227, but somebody has to sell it at $227 uh, or lower, only then your order can be full. Similarly, if you go and want to sell something at $229, you need somebody to ready to buy at that price or higher. Right? Usually, in equilibrium setting, there are people who want to sell at a price, and there are people who want to buy at a price, and they're sitting there waiting for their demands to be uh, met. And that's why you've got uh, price for ask and price for bid. The, and these are the sort of things that sort of on this exchange are publicly available uh, on like standard setting. So you get all this rich amount of information. Uh, over that time, roughly one way to count it is how many data points I have. Uh, there are roughly 200 million raw data points. So it's a moderate size, but nothing uh, too gigantic. Uh, and we converted this thing into a time series. So each one is a time series because the price is a time series, and then I've got 60 bytes prices and associated volumes of prices, time series. So I've got some high dimensional time series data uh, clocked at 10 seconds to keep it simple. And now we've got this data, and the question is so what I want to do is I want to predict price at each point of time and use that prediction to decide whether uh, I can sort of uh, hold my, um, I can invest into them so that I can sort of uh, make profit. Now, again, my interest was primarily to understand how a simple method it has been successful in other scenarios, believe in the method, question is, can it extract signal out of in this setting? And so I did not want to have a fancy investment strategy, it's just an extremely simple investment strategy that can sort of see if uh, it out. So here's a very, very simple thing. Every time I'm going to maintain a position which is plus one, zero, or minus one. So either I own a Bitcoin or I short it or nothing. Okay. Right. Now, how do I sort of change over time? But each time instance, I will do the following. I'll, I have some, 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 uh, uh, I'm in some state, plus one, zero, or minus one. I'll see sort of what is the sort of change in the price in the next 10 seconds. Uh, I'll predict it and I'll explain how I will do it. And then based on that, I will decide whether to uh, whether to uh, change my position or not. In particular, if, if the change is going to be reasonably large enough, then and my position is less than equal to zero, is that I'm nothing or I'm shorting something, I'm going to buy something. Because I know that if I buy and if indeed my prediction is true, after that I can sell it and I can make profit out of that. Similarly, if it's Less than, uh, it's less than, sorry, minus should be there. If less than minus threshold, then I will, and my current position is greater than equal to zero, then I will sell. Otherwise, that will happen. Questions about strategy? Right, so, yeah. Why not vary the amount of Bitcoin? Absolutely, you can do that. Uh, I'm not going to do that because my interest is primarily to understand am I predicting my price as well? And I don't want to sort of confuse it with the gain that I can get because of my clever strategies. If I want sort of as dumb a strategy as possible, but I want something, so I need to vary myself by a little bit. This is the minimal amount of little bit that I need. And after that, I will let the prices dictate whether I can make money. Now, the second question, which is, uh, which is a subtle one that you would ask, is well, if I can make money with this, what if I started scaling? Will it, will it grow linearly? Answer should be no, because you know, it, if it has to grow linearly, that means that I need I need sort of reasonably fat order books. Otherwise, how would I execute my? So it shouldn't happen that way. Now, of course, sort of then you can ask more interesting question: Can I further refine it by balancing the amount of things I do and so on and so forth? Yes, you can do that. But again, my interest here was: Can I get the first order of uh, information in the prediction? As you can see, as sort of, uh, my talk is progressing, there's very little about Bitcoin. So in case you came to sort of, uh, figure out how to sort of crunch Bitcoins, uh, pardon me for wasting your 6 p.m. lovely time, but hopefully that's not the case. In any case, there's a question. How does this, um, the spread between bid and ask will compare with the threshold you set up there? Sorry, what again? Like, what's the difference um, between the bid and ask for spread compared uh -huh. with the threshold that you have? Uh, yeah, so threshold was predetermined. Um, it did not sort of depend on the the the, the, uh, the ratio of bid and ask. 
However, we did use the bid and ask information, as I was told you in a second, to determine what we would predict as a change in the price. Right, I think my question is, uh, if the spread between bid and ask is extremely large, yeah. and the threshold is kind of constant, yeah. uh, how do you make sure you make money from the threshold? Sure, so in some sense, it's a dumb strategy. I still want to see if I can predict. And uh, I say, so I'm trying to tie my hands as much as possible in terms of strategy. Usually my goal is to see if I can sort of actually predict this one. It's, it's a good question. And of course, in, for that reason, as you're pointing out, uh, I would actually use the information about sort of the, uh, the differences between bid and ask to sort of determine my prediction. Okay, so just sort of to whet your appetite, um, here is the, the summary of uh, our uh, uh, offline simulation. Uh, what we did is that we took, the, we took the entire period, which is from February to July, and till May, we used that as a training to train various parameters, including the threshold. And after it's fixed, from this point onwards, we ran the system uh, cause of the years until we did not use any future information to decide what to do. And then so we ran the trading study. Now I'm plotting two time series here. This is the time. This one axis which is uh, representing the price of Bitcoin and that's a blue time series. And then sort of on the this axis I'm plotting the, the profit, cumulative profit that we made at that point in time and that's the uh, black time series. And the summary is that this is the amount of profit we, we made for the days by average investment of this, and this was the return. So, so what to say is sort of, there is this reasonable signal that you can extract out of this. Yes, please. So if you're really interested in your prediction power, should you be kind of compensating for the fact that Bitcoin went down in value during your investing period? I, if what we're really interested in is the prediction power, mm -hmm. do we want to compensate for the fact that Bitcoin went up in value? It seems like that would be reflected in the return. You mean so Bitcoin will have increased in value? Yes. Okay, so one way to do that is this. Is oh. Exactly the right thing. Uh, I mean, you want to be sort of more precise. You would say, let me sort of find out the sharp ratio, and then the risk-free investment, which is what you're saying. Let me see, am I so many making any profit over it, and then sort of normalize it for the sort of the variation. Uh, standard formula, uh, bottom line is that's a number, 4.1. Is that good, bad, ugly? Well, if you are in this business, maybe sort of sharp ratio of 4.1, depending on what type of investor you are, is uh, not great because maybe you want nine. But if you are sort of uh, wondering about if, in case, looks like most of you are young, maybe you are worried about your 401 case. In case you're worried about it, and if you are around places like MIT, you would use something like Fidelity, and then most of the Fidelity's uh, uh, options have a sharp ratio of around two. In that sense, this is the reason. Yes, please. What do you use for the risk-free rate, and what do you use for like the index to um, measure the things? So that's the risk. Okay. As you said, so if, uh, I'm a company to keep my... Okay, so uh, the summary set of, at least from my perspective, summary is that well, Looks like sort of this is a reasonable strategy, and you are getting some signal. So the question is that how did we get a signal? Okay, that's the meat of the trial. Right. So I'm going to sort of go through that. Uh, unless anybody has a question. Okay, so it's basically a simple regression. Now, just to remind all of us, uh, pardon me for here being uh, too pedantic, but classically the way one would look, think of regression is as follows: right? I've got a uh, bunch of training data points, X i's and Y i's. Okay, so uh, Y is the label that I want to predict, and X is something that's what I see. Okay. Uh, but X i Y is given to me, and what I want to do is for a given observation, I want to predict the associated label Y uh, using the history I have. And then sort of uh, is a standard non-parametric approach is where you say, well, let me try to fit a function that sort of relates my observations to my labels, and maybe there's some noise. And from training data, I'm going to try to learn this function. One standard function is uh, linear regression. Uh, and linear regression would say that function is a linear function of my observations. 
and is a simple, uh, simple way to solve. It. This is one way to go about it. Uh, this type of approach is one be useful, for, I guess, for our setting because the type of data I'm interested in is X's are effectively my different segments of time series of different uh, different time period up to till current time. So let's say I'm at time zero. I want to predict what's going to happen in the near, near future. I'm going to look at my recent past of varying length, and that's a sort of a high dimensional time series data, or multi dimensional time series thing. I'm going to use that to predict what's going to be my future. Okay, now I have got a training data available because I've seen enough history about sort of how that time series varied and sort of how its future segment looked like. You can go back sort of, let's say, sort of at time minus 10, look at its history. And then look at sort of from minus 10, how did its future look like? So that future was my label, and the history from that point was my uh, axis. Okay, so I can sort of generate lots of such training data from my past, and I can sort of predict. The problem is that sort of this type of approach is what works. There are uh, more interesting um, time series models like you know, Arma, Arma models and so on, that not work well. And this uh, simple approach works really well, uh, where the idea is that well, let's not let's think of sort of x and y's as some kind of a joint distribution. And what I want to do is I want to use the I want to compute in some sense conditional distribution of y given x. I want to use empirical data as my uh, proxy, and then based on that I want to just predict conditional value of my label given my observation. Now it's a what's known as a Bayesian regression. The problem with this is that in general this could be terrible because I need I mean, I'm trying to sort of predict. I'm trying to sort of learn um, joint distribution over extremely high, uh, uh, extremely complex space. So maybe I need some structure, and the basic idea of our structure was in what we call a latent source model. Um, instead of going into the detail of this, the uh, and let me sort of let me not sort of say. Basic idea is this. Okay? So I've got these are different uh, price variation segments over time. Some of them sort of uh, led after this time, let's say, increase in price. Some of them led to decrease in price. Okay. So I can sort of divide my sort of uh, time segments into sort of the x's and y's. Now, one hypothesis behind the model that I did not describe is that well, price changes happen somewhat in a seemingly unstructured way, but there are only few such ways in which things happen. Okay, it's like. Uh, uh, analogously speaking, people shop, but people shop only in three different ways. People who are brand aware of people, people who are like, uh, who don't care about what clothes they wear, such as me, and they just go and shop whatever is the first thing that's available, and so on. Similarly, in this world, when price increases or decreases, interestingly, there are only a few different ways in which sort of these things are happening. I don't know what those ways are. I don't need to know those ways are, because that's effectively the point of this method. That is. If I were to predict what's going to happen in the near-term future, let me look at recent past. Uh, let me compare it with all histories that I have. Okay? If that looks close to me, I will sort of give it high weight, otherwise I will give it low weight. And then whatever this history is, let me look at its, its future. And that sort of would give me sort of what my future is. Make sense? Okay, there are uh, the three people here and sort of uh, if they're all three of them are similar to me, I will take their labels and then sort of use them. But if two of them are similar and one is not, I will not take that person's label, but I'll take these two. And, um, and that's it. And so one way to think of it is data is my model, the historical data. And when I want to sort of compute what's going to happen in future, I'm going to look at my current segment, compare it with each of the historical segments, compute similarities, look at their future, weight them, aggregate them, and that will give me a predictive future. Okay, and uh, that's basically it. And this is precisely how, uh, how final prices were computed. So the final price was a linear combination of different price predictions I will make using three different segments and the R, where R is actually depends on this uh, spread, okay? And 
So what are these different PIs one for i equals to one, two, three? They're based on three different time segments, time segments of the three different lengths. The 30 minute history, 60 minute history, and 120 minute history. And that's that. Alright, so I think I will describe you everything I wanted to tell you. Yeah. So of the three actions that you would take short, buy, or do nothing. Yeah. What was the distribution of those three actions for each like, time segment? Good question. Um, so you would you would imagine that sort of, you need enough oscillation to happen, otherwise I won't make a problem. Yeah. So uh, there was enough oscillation. Like, uh, and it has to be balanced because, so I would say, if I were to sort of, uh, uh, for sure it was sort of, uh, roughly even in terms of going up and down, how many times I crossed, crisscrossed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, sort of, uh, because my sort of uh, difference is bounded at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, precisely how many things, I don't know, I don't remember. I, mean, I didn't calculate it. Yeah. So the, the shorts equaled the buys, but would the do nothings be like like 1% of the actions or 9% of the actions? It won't be 90%, and it for sure, it can't, none of them will be more than 50% as Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. By design. Because sort of, uh, if you have only sort of few states, you just can't sort of. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wait, what were the particular X features that you picked? Seriously, that you picked. What were the particular X features that you picked for each time step? Uh, we, okay, so. Uh, we took only the uh, only the uh, only the, the the time series of price variation or price of length thirty minutes, sixty minutes, and one hundred twenty minutes. Those were my X's. But uh, if I have like a long history, I can chop off in many by sliding window. I can create lots of thirty minutes, lots of sixty minutes, and lots of one hundred twenty minutes. So those were my X's basically. Like the recurring capacity intervals? Uh, no, it's just actual actual time series. Say sort of, okay. if I think of them as uh, um, uh, one times like ten seconds, it's uh, it's some vector in uh, uh, high dimension. Okay. Yeah. So each ten second period, you saw that you had one data point. Uh, that is correct. How did you generate that one data point? Uh, so you have the whole order book during that 10 second interval. Is it a traded price during that period, or is it a weighted uh, good. volume? Uh, good. So sort of, uh, it's, it's uh, basically sort of transactions that are happening. Okay. So, so only traded. Yeah. So correct. So in between, if there's nothing is happening, I will, I will just sort of interpolate it between this point and the next one, and then I'll take the interpolation point. Good point. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, because you. So then you had uh, small positions earlier on. Does that mean that if you were already holding a Bitcoin, you didn't have the option to buy another? Yep. Or it's just that every day you're choosing to buy, sell, or hold one Bitcoin? Uh, no, no, no. So at any point of time, yeah. I will either hold a Bitcoin, okay. I'll be shorting one, or I will, be doing, I will have nothing. So my position is very simple. Okay. I cannot accumulate my position, or I cannot sort of continue short. And then uh, for like closing out your position, do you just close out on the last day, and then assume like profits loss on the yeah, I don't think it's sort of mattered at that because okay. I've given this sort of it's like this sort of a small thing. Mm -hmm. question. So just kind of a practical question. You saw that you realized a large return based on you know, your research. Did this go into practice? And if not, why not? Uh, okay, so there's a sort of... Um, there's two, two types of practice. One is like so you go and uh, so start taking that stuff. Uh, so about, I've not done that yet. Okay. Uh, one thing to realize is that, as I sort of clearly mentioned, this strategy is not going to scale. It might get me my money for my coffee, but if one wants to scale it, so one has to uh, sort of figure out a little more than what I just took. Uh, and my interest here was uh, purely at time. Yeah. Now, as far as uh, what's beyond this that we are doing, 
But I think um, there is uh, this style of uh, prediction uh, using, um, it's a very simple uh, algorithm utilized. Uh, and it does deserve the question that sort of, can it actually happen? Can it sort of actually run in real time? So if you, if you look at this kind of computation, it scales linearly with number of data points. If you have lots of data points, uh, you can compute this in parallel, but that will sort of uh, you end up spending a lot of time. Okay, so if you want to sort of run this in real time, you really need sophisticated uh, infrastructure. What we're doing right now is we're building a sophisticated infrastructure, if I may say so. <coughs> Traders, which I'm not first hand familiar with, but second hand, have a, a library of uh, methods, uh, magic potions of various sorts. Yeah. Is this a strategy for uh, classifying those or ranking them in some objective way? So good. Uh, this slide for that. If uh, there's a notion of technical trading. Okay, and the notion of technical trading is that you look at the price pattern and they say, aha, that's going to be head and shoulder. So if it's head and shoulder and I have seen, let's say, <laughs> so much, I know it's going to go up at this point. If it's going to go up, maybe I should do something. Right? Or you can sort of say, well, maybe it looks something like this, which is uh, called triangle. These are all terms out there in the future. Now, these are the patterns actually that it turned out to be uh, something that sort of as, a, as an explanation of our algorithm, we could pull it out from data. And that turned out to be very similar to what people have already observed, empirically or whatever you call it, in literature. So, connecting back to your question, I would say one way to think of this method is that if you believe in technical trading, don't, don't rely on your eyes, just use this. Yes, please. Uh, why do you think? Bitcoin prices was an interesting thing to use this to extract information from. Uh, say that again, please. Why Bitcoin prices versus any other sort of data you could predict off of? Uh, okay, so a few years back, uh, we actually started with this. A few years back, uh, we were using the same method to predict um, whether uh, a topic would become viral on Twitter. Yes. And some point when I was giving the talk about that in, uh, in um, our department here in computer science, Somebody said, well, if you really believe that your method can work, go make money. And I took it to heart. Uh, so, well, I don't want to really make, maybe I want to make money, maybe I don't want. That's a separate thing. But point is, so, point well taken. Maybe Twitter is fundamentally predictable. And so, sure, my method or any other method would work. Uh, maybe sort of, uh, I should go and sort of uh, play with the big boys and sort of find out if I can sort of do some prediction. Uh, now, then the next question is that, well, first, my first reaction was go and sort of scrape uh, data from one of those uh, uh, Yahoo exchanges. Problem there is that sort of the data that you get if you're played with it is at, um, at far and apart sort of time interval where sort of already whatever information is there, somebody out there has already swept it away. So it's really not fair comparison for them. And to get real sort of data from in real time, I have to pay a lot of money that sort of uh, didn't want to do. And so that's why sort of Bitcoin turned out to be the unique choice because A, is large enough volume, B, is, um, it was reasonably well traded. If you sort of plot the, sort of the, let's say if you plot the frequency component of your time series, you'll find it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Do you have the intention of retraining your model given that now there's more historical data and maybe we've seen some reduction in volatility from the days that you were studying? Yeah, so this is something we've published in Hands Hands Figure. So what we found is that sort of, of course, since, as I mentioned, we've been continuously working on it. Uh, what we find is that sort of, uh, not these, but other things, and sort of you can sort of do, uh, the way we trained it is we trained for some months and then we used it fixed. But you can sort of constantly keep training yourself. And there are variations of this, natural variations, and that sort of results into a 3x performance pattern. That's just not by without tuning. A little bit clever. So there's a value to that. If would you ex consider extending then the time windows beyond 30, 60, 120 minutes if you've you had additional data? That helps a lot. Okay. And if, um, uh, uh, 
30, 60, 120 is just, really just a number, just a hunch that sort of this is roughly the time scale at which things change. But actually, the 10 minutes and 45 minutes and uh, 180 minutes is a better bet. Turns out. Do you know if there's an intelligent way of choosing these window sizes? Yeah, cross cross one. Yeah, sure. But that's com com constantly keep changing. It. <laughs> and you can constantly keep cross one. Well, one suggestion for that would be that if it's relative to volatility in the market, so it could be based upon the time of day or just well, sure. trading volume, anything like that, is a more so, so you can sort of make a meta method of, out of this. So you know, if recent history looks like this, and we sort of now we can sort of do the same thing with the parameters, right? The parameters of the algorithm, you can also make them a function of sort of your recent time series. But you can sort of keep building layers on top of that if you want to think of it. Introduce people more to Bitcoin. Uh, if you're